It's wonderful knowing that you're still there. It's still the breakfast on uh, Plus TV Africa right now. We're talking uh, on an issue that we hope to rest very soon mm -hmm. <laughs> because we've been talking about this all the time. Remember that COP28 is happening in Dubai and Nigeria went there with a delegation of 1,411. The uproar was that the number is too much when the country is grappling with economic crisis here and there. The federal government first of all said that it is only about 800 that they took to the place and now the number has been cut to 422. The federal government said they only sponsored 422. We're still trying to find out the rationale behind all that. We have uh, Mr. Shegun Shokwetson, principal partner Woodridge and Scott Consulting here with us uh, to help us make sense mm. of this. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Okay, so we are we are down to four four two two uh, number. Uh, COP twenty eight is uh, happening in uh, Dubai. First of all, let's have an insight to what you feel about our participation in the first place in COP twenty eight because there are divergent uh, opinions. Some say. Uh, because of what we contribute to the global warming, we are not even supposed to be there when other people are talking. The culprits, uh, in quote, are talking about how to save the planet, as it were. What do you think uh, should be our role and relationship with this group of people talking climate change? Yeah, thanks for having me. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting issue. Um, breaking it all down, uh, will have to be fact-based. And I like being fact-based about the way I look at things. Um, so first of all, to answer the question that you just asked directly, um, do we have to be there? I'd say absolutely, we have to be there. Um, so climate change is a reality. Um, global warming is a thing. And it's not just a reality and a thing. These are things that have significant impact on everybody on this planet. Whether you are a climate culprit or a climate victim, there is an impact on you, right? So anywhere that people are sitting down to have the conversations around the issues of climate change, um, obviously those conversations will be about how it's happened, what's resulting, what's causing, you know, the climate change issue, and what can be done, you know, to mitigate the effects and perhaps to even reverse some of these things that are happening to us as a planet. Everybody that is involved must be at the table, you know. So it's it's a it's a conversation that, of course, we have to be a part of, um, because we are if even if we are not culprits, we are definitely victims, and uh, um, decisions are going to be made regarding how the, the planet, the world moves forward um, about that matter. We must be a part of that decision because if you are not at the table, then whatever is decided. Um, you know, you, you are bound by it anyway. You know, so so I, I don't buy to that argument about us not uh, needing to be there. We absolutely need to be there. Let's not also forget that Nigeria is the biggest country by population and by economy in Africa. We are the largest black nation in the world. How can anybody suggest that something as momentous and as significant as this is happening? And Nigeria will not be there. It, it's, it's, I mean, look, whoever is saying that probably simply doesn't understand what the issues are. Maybe, you know, there are some people that think that climate change is a hoax. Um, Donald Trump actually said something like, that. oh, it's a Chinese thing. There's nothing like climate change. Um, you know, so if, you, if, you, if you're in that school of thought, then you would say things like that. You say, oh, no, what are we even doing there? But climate change is real. The ocean levels are rising. Yeah. If not for the, yeah, if not for the reclamation efforts that happened, you know, on the Babbage, um, anybody who was old enough to have visited Babbage uh, 30 years ago, you know, it's shocking to discover where the waterfront had gotten to. Mm. The waterfront of, 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 of the Atlantic Ocean was right on Amadu Bello Way. Right on it, you could see the crashing waves, and it will spill over. I'm not talking of flood, though. The ocean will spill over onto the road just as a result of the crashing waves. That's how serious um, the rising water levels had been. You know, so we have to push back on that. There is um, the, the ice caps, the ice peaks in the North Pole, you know, are melting as a result of the increasing temperature of the planet. 
and that melting water must find its level. So what's happening is that countries are getting subsumed in water very slowly. And somebody had said that, look, Lagos, if we're not careful, in 50 years, Lagos would have a significant chunk of Lagos, the entirety of Victoria Island and Ipoi, may be underwater if action is not taken. Of course, we have taken action as a country, but the action will be insignificant if the action is isolated. So there is a, there is a global concert to fight and push back on climate change. And I'm particularly excited that the world appears to be taking this very seriously now, as you can see in the numbers of delegates that has um, attended this from all over the world. So this is not just a Nigerian thing, actually. We've okay. had a, a significant jump in the number of delegates attending COP28 relative to the other COPs. Okay. Okay, let's talk numbers now. Um, about 1,411 people went from Nigeria as delegates. Um, however, the federal government came back to say it was only about 800 and something that they sponsored. And now they've, they're back again saying they only sponsored 422. Do you think that number was too much first? And secondly, is there something fishy with the numbers that they're saying this? they only sponsored a few to make it look like they're not wasting our resources? Look, I, I think that um, just speaking as an outsider, and I think it's important to provide a caveat, I'm not a part of the workings of government. Um, I don't know what, what's informed the number of uh, participants from the number of ministries and agencies that have gone there. Um, I would assume and imagine and hope that they really do have um, significant duties and roles to play at the conference. But just speaking as an outsider, I honestly don't understand why we need 422, much less 800, much less 1,411 people mm. at a climate change conversation. We need our Ministry of Environment. We need our Ministry of um, maybe Energy, Oil and Gas, you know, the oil, oil industry. Um, obviously, for obvious reasons, they are, they are significant contributors to, to the matter. Um, maybe we need a few state governments, of national governments that are bearing the largest impact of, of, of the effects of climate change in Nigeria, the states in the southeast, for example, uh, maybe a labor state who has to continue to combat rising water levels. But to be honest, I don't understand why the numbers have to run into as many as they have, uh, as, as they have done. Um, but there is a caveat to that. So that's why I said I, I don't understand. That doesn't mean that it's bad. It just means that the government needs to be more um, forthcoming with information. They need to explain in as simple terms as possible um, why each of those people have to be there. What role precisely are they playing? Um, um, you know, 1,400, whether they are private sector people or government people, we have to assume that they are going there to play specific roles. What are those roles? What are those roles? Um, 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 if the government doesn't come out to explain these things, then you will have the rumor mill, you know, going into hyperdrive as it is right now. So people will not have a choice but to speculate if there is no information now. To, to trim the number from 800 plus to 400 plus is also disingenuous. Which one should we believe? Mm. Um, so so I, I would really encourage uh, government officials to be more portrayed to operate with candor when they are dealing with the people of Nigeria, because it is our money, and nobody should make any mistake about that. It is our money. No matter who you are, uh, you know, as a Nigerian, it is your money that is being spent. The, the lowest tax paying person in Nigeria pays value added tax. Everybody in this country pays value added tax. And so um, it's, it's important that the government understands that people actually do have a right to ask and have a role, you know, to, to, to play in, in this entire conversation. Whatever is discussed in, in, in those uh, conferences, the impact is being felt by the people. There is nothing like, you know, Nigeria as a country doesn't exist if there is no human being inside it. So people demand, people owe, people um, deserve to be informed um, about why, why their money is being spent in the manner that it is. So whether it's 422 or 888, whatever. You know, um, we, we need explanations. We need clear explanations as to why this is there. I don't understand it. Um, yeah, okay. Let me... Okay, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah, you, you, are a, you are part of the civil society. And one of the arguments is that the people that went there, 
some of them, like you said, uh, private sector and all that, uh, civil society organizations went as well. Well, I was wondering what the civil society will do uh, because I'm wondering, will they be given a chance to address the, 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 the gathering? Because if civil society from every country addresses the gathering, I wonder how it's going to be. Will there be workshops that they will attend and proffer solutions? We don't know. Because yesterday I was watching a report in one of the sister stations, and uh, the federal government, first of all, gave a number, like Ijo Youth Association went to the, uh, the conference with about 15 participants or more. And someone who was on ground said that he went with that delegation and they were not up to 10. So numbers being badnied mm. around, we don't even know how it is. But what exactly will the civil society be doing as individual civil societies that they couldn't have sent delegation to represent them uh, at that place? Because even that same reporter was saying the gallery where these people were supposed to sit, nobody is there. Probably a lot of them are just doing shopping uh, mm -hmm. in the malls in Dubai and all that. So what critical role were the civil society organizations supposed to play at the COP28, if you have that insight? Uh, okay, so, so um, like you said, I'm a member of civil society, so I have, have a good understanding of how civil society works. And in this instance, you have to expand the terminology civil society to include non-governmental organizations, yes. um, NGOs. And you will agree that there are NGOs whose, whose charter, whose primary uh, raison their trade um, is, is revolves around the climate conversation, subject of climate change. So if, if a discussion is going on about that, they have to be there. Um, they will be there to provide their knowledge, their expert, private sector-driven perspective on the issues. That's one. They have to be there, perhaps, to provide some sort of oversight at their cost, obviously. I mean, this, these things that we're talking about cannot be at the cost of government. Uh, you know, but if, if a civil society organization decides that, look, um, I want to monitor what's happening, um, at at um, at COP, I want to see what role Nigeria is playing. I want to see what Nigerian government officials are saying. I want to see what positions they are pushing. I want to see how um, they are um, going about their participation. You know, for example, you say uh, some of the galleries were empty. Where were the people, right? So a, a, a CSO that is geared or whose activities are geared towards um, ensuring accountability and transparency. You know, in the activities of government, might decide to send two or you know one or two people to to have a first-hand view of how government is conducting its activities there. Um, that I don't see a problem with. Um, some might have, like I said earlier, might have perspectives and might be able to participate in you know in the in the sideline events, um, helping you know push the position of Nigeria, helping push um, the interests of Nigeria. Because we must not forget that at the end of the day, you know, there are negotiations going on and interests of in fact there are professional negotiators on, uh, who are parties, you know, who are uh, parties, government parties, you know, to this to this uh, conference. So um, interests are very important, and some of these NGOs, some of these civil society organizations will help government um, with the perspective they need to better push the interest of Nigeria. So I have absolutely no problem with civil society. Um, even people like the Joy Youth Council, you know, yeah, why not? Because they are victims, they are climate victims, and we all know what's happening in the, in the Niger Delta, you know. Um, they can't farm. Um, Potakot, a city as big as Potakot, has a suit problem where black dust falls from the sky. You hang your clothes on the line to dry, and when you go back to pick them up later in the evening, it's covered in black dust, mm. black soot. You know, so I mean, look, we have to be there to push, you know, that argument to let people know, if possible, from as first hand a set of people as possible, how this thing is affecting us. Why? Because there is money to be shared, and I think the commission must get to this part. There is money. There is a whole lot of money to be shared, you know, as a result of COP28. And everybody that is there is going to jostle for as much of that money as possible, especially you know countries that have been the victims of the climate climate change phenomenon.
Okay, so talking about money being shared, right? Um, is the money supposed to be based on the number of people that go there, one? And two, don't you think it's a waste of resources if that's not the case? Don't you think it's a waste of resources for us to send so much people considering the crippling economy in Nigeria? Yeah, I mean, like I said before, I, I really don't support the large delegation. And, and it doesn't matter. And I think it's important for our government officials to understand that it does not matter whether you know, the 1,411 yeah. people were funded with public funds or not. It does not matter. They are spending money. And when you have an economy that is bleeding the way Nigeria's economy is bleeding, when you have an exchange rate that is out of control, you have inflation that is galloping out of control, you have purchasing power reducing, you need investments in manufacturing, you, know, you need to revive and, um, and kickstart, give, give, give the economy a good kick in the heart so that it can, it can start pumping well again. Um, all efforts must be concerted. Um, in terms of optics, in terms of, um, of just the, the, the messaging from government, in terms of messaging as a country, as a people, to ourselves, we cannot be taking part in jamborees. You know, I, I can't, for the life of me, understand why we need 1,411 human beings to go push our interests. I, and please, I, it's important for the sake of balance for Nigerians to understand that I am not saying that it's, that COP is not important. COP is critical. It's critically important to the, to the, to the survival, even to the economic interest of Nigeria. But you do not need, I don't think you need 1,411 people to go push our interests. I just don't see it, not in a situation where the economy is you know, where it is. I think you could easily have gone to that event with maybe a 300 party type of thing, maybe 200. There are countries that went with those types of numbers, you know. So I'm trying to be balanced here, and I understand that there are countries that went with double what we went with, you know. And there are countries, you know, even last year, there are countries that also went with very large numbers. So I'm trying to be balanced, but I still just don't understand why we need these large numbers. Um, but again, for the sake of balance, please note that as the climate conversation continues to increase, in terms of the relevance and importance that it is given by nations across the world. The attendance of this event is going to be taken more seriously, and you may have a larger number of people, especially when you have on the table the type of money. You are talking of $0.1 trillion. That's $100 billion being on the table to help um, deal with the climate change problem. So you see a jump. I mean, the total number of delegates last year was about 40,000. 40,000, the entire number of delegates from across the world. We're talking almost 100,000 today. So we're talking well over 150% jump in the attendance. So we will see this. You probably will see more people at COP29 because the climate problem is taken more seriously, like more money being thrown at it, you know, and all of that. So um, I understand the importance of this. I understand the need to have more people go there to push your case, to push your argument, to fight for your interest. But for a country going through what it's going through now, I just can't, for the, for the life of me, find it within me to say, no, this is okay. I, I don't think this is okay. I think we could have done this far more efficiently. Yeah, maybe the Dubai factor is also part of it. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. And when we see next year and we see this kind of number, we'll know that they, were, they weren't there because of COP28. But like I said, the Dubai factor could be a part of the reason people are so many. We had the same number with China that has like... A, uh, 1.4 billion people, and they, they came with the same number, mm -hmm. 1,411 people, just like we did. We have just over 200 million people here. And we're thinking hotels, we're thinking um, Flights, transportation, yeah. we're thinking other things, even the shopping that they, will, they are bound to do before they, they come back to this place, and how they are enriching somebody for their economy, apart from our own economy. And we're just wondering, well... There's nothing else we can do. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, you know just, just for perspective, though, um, last year, Nigeria went with a very small delegation. Mm. Nigeria went with, I think it was less than 50 people that went for COP. In fact, our president wasn't there. <laughs> that, so I think we also need to understand that this new president has an, a, an outward-looking approach in his, in his uh, governance style. He's, at this moment, 
thinking about how to bring the world into Nigeria and how to bring the benefits that are outside of the world into Nigeria. And I think that may also inform why, um, you know, we have this like vision. But have we, but swept our room? Give... Have, have we swept our room and made our bed so that the strangers can come and sleep yeah. in there? Because it's, yeah, I mean, yeah. we're fishing for people to come to For to foreign Nigeria investors. When we know that uh, there are issues that we need to address before people can be comfortable to come visit and do business. I have, absolutely, absolutely. I agree with you. And I've said this, uh, you know, as often as I've had the opportunity to speak, that we do need to do a lot of housekeeping and house cleaning. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you do the housekeeping and house cleaning, then what you find is that you don't need too much marketing. You don't need to go out there to say mm -hmm. too much. Investment will flow in. You know, but it's important again for balance to say that pop is different because this is not going after foreign investment per se. There will be foreign investment conversations on the sidelines. There will be conversations about renewable energy, for example, because that fits right into the agenda of pop. You know, but besides the investment conversations, whether it's on renewables, whether it's on transition, energy transition, and all of that, there is the loss and damage fund, hundred billion dollars. And everybody will go there to say, look at the loss and damage I have suffered in my country. And they will try to monetize and quantify, you know, you know, the, the negative impact that climate change has had on them. In some instances, you might even try to tie the damage that you have suffered as a result of climate change to specific sectors, to specific countries, you know, across the world. 75% um, of global gas uh, 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 you know, climate gases are emitted by G20 nations. A country like Pakistan, who has suffered, we all know, the kind of ravaging floods, typhoons, hurricanes that countries like Pakistan, Indonesia have suffered. But they, they contribute less than 1% to, 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 to green, greenhouse emissions. You know, so we, we have to go there, have conversations to try and pin down this impact De determine the financial implication of the impact, the losses we have suffered, who are the people responsible for those losses, if possible, and therefore, how much money needs to come in terms of reparations, if you like. Because that's what the loss and damage, uh, you know, funding is really, you know, get towards achieving. Some sort of reparations and some sort of damage control, some sort of uh, investment to renew the earth, knowing that if the earth in the Niger Delta is renewed and is revived, there is a positive impact to them in Canada and in the United States because the world is a global village. Everything is an ecosystem that must be balanced. And right now, the balance is being shifted, and um, the earth is basically limping and walking on half a leg instead of on two legs. You know, so so it's it's all it, it all sort of interconnects each other. And I understand the need for these conversations. It's just that we must continue to call our government out that. We can achieve these things, in my view, and maybe wrong, without going with these types, types of large numbers that are going to buy, apparently, to go shopping. And I've seen videos. I've seen videos of some people that I know for a fact have absolutely no business being in Dubai, being on this delega delegation. And, you know, and that's, that's not a good thing. We need to see government deal with candor and honesty with people of Nigeria and deal with responsibility. And you know, we need to see them. Um, 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 making a very deliberate, conscious, obvious effort to keep things tight with mm. government costs and government expenditure. And this is really, really not uh, good uh, for the government mm. coming from that angle. Okay. Well, may COP28 not turn us to cops. <laughs> <laughs> to copses. <laughs> okay. We're all hoping for the best, and we do hope that when that money comes and gets to Nigeria, because mm -hmm. we must have a chunk of that money, mm -hmm. uh, it will be spent uh, judiciously, and not to buy cars and yachts and everything that uh, we've been complaining about in Nigeria. We'd like to thank you, Mr. Shekun Shokutan, for coming on the program and bearing your thoughts. Thanks for having me. Thank Always you. A all right, we'll be talking with Mr. Shegun Chokuton, principal partner, Woodbridge and Scotland Voting. He was on the show talking about the delegation to Dubai for the COP28 and how Nigerians have reacted to that. Uh, well, uh, I, just, I just remember a very inspiring story about a woman who did not have any inheritance but became a millionaire on her own mm. uh, by trying to do something and teaching others to do that as well. I think his, um, uh, her name is Breadlove, Sarah Breadlove. Yeah. So if okay. you want to read up on Breadlove, you can just go read up 
Fred Love. He, she married at 14. By 18, she had a child. By 20, she was a widow. Mm -hmm. And then she started doing one or two things. But the thing that struck me was that she started working in a factory that gave her an ailment. Mm -hmm. But instead of the ailment being what will kill her, mm -hmm. the ailment became, became the inspiration for her to become the first independent millionaire that rose up to that status without an inheritance. That's an inspiring That's story too. Yes, <laughs> yes. You can achieve anything mm -hmm. as long as you set your mind yes. to it. And don't just let only AI to do that, please. No, don't be mentally lazy. <laughs> okay. Uh, possibly this is where we are going to draw the curtain. I know we are going to be with our host for the day. Uh, but until we meet again tomorrow, on another way to do this. My name is Nyam. My name is Rume Paulson. Have an amazing day.